brennt auf Feuer und in Stub ist heiß. Und Rebellen, kleine Kinderlein, der Mal lief Beis. Und Rebellen, kleine Kinderlein, der Mal lief Beis. Setze Kinder, lach gedenkje Teirel. Was ist noch einmal und das noch einmal. Komm mit alle noch einmal und das noch einmal. Komm mit alle Lernt Kinder mit Kreuzgeschick, also so gehören. Wird Gicher von euch kennen, Ivre, der Bakumt davon. Was wird Gicher von euch kennen, Ivre, der Bakumt davon. Setze Kinder lach, gedenkje Teire, wo sie lernen. Sagtje noch einmal und tacke noch einmal. Komm mit Zahli vor, sagt ihr nach Hamol und tacke nach Hamol, komm mit Zahli vor. Als ihr wird Kinder älter werden, wird ihr allein verstehen, wie viel in die Oasis liegen Prärin und wie viel wie viel in die Oasis liegen Tränen und wie viel Gewein. Als ihr wird Kinder dem Golle schleppen, euch gemutscht sein, sollt ihr von die Oasis Koyach schäpen, guckt in sie rein. Sollt ihr von die Oasis Koyach schäpen, guckt in sie rein. Good morning. My name is Wendy Weisbrot. Along with Tara Karch Cross, we are honored to be co-chairs of this year's Yom HaShoah commemoration, Lador Vador, from generation to generation. Tara and I would like to thank our passionate Yom HaShoah Committee for their many contributions. We would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible leadership of Elizabeth Schramm, Director of the Holocaust Resource Center, Anne Marie Caracella, President of the Holocaust Resource Center, and Rob Goldberg, CEO of the Buffalo Jewish Federation, for their tireless work, dedication, and support in making today's commemoration a reality. We meet again, this year virtually, to remember a world lost and to honor the memory of the six million Jewish victims who were systematically murdered in the Holocaust. That most murderous period of history began in 1933 with government-sponsored discrimination against those the government considered less than human. Voices for justice, voices for freedom, and voices for humanity were silent. When the targeted slaughter of six million Jews and five million others, including Poles, people with disabilities, Roma, Sinti, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, Soviet prisoners of war and political dissidents was over, those who survived the death camps told us that the last words of many who walked to their deaths were remember us, remember us. As a second generation Holocaust survivor, those words, remember us, Zahor, are etched in my heart and my soul. My father, Joe Diamond, a survivor of Auschwitz in the torturous death march from Matthausen to Gunskirchen, fought with all of his might to survive simply so he could share the stories for those who could not. Despite the horrors he endured, and the unimaginable loss that he suffered, 
My father still believed there could be a future where all human beings are treated with dignity and mutual respect. He believed that the only way he could achieve justice was by sharing his incomprehensible experiences so that our community could learn from the horrors of the Holocaust. And so, the purpose of Yom HaShoah is to ensure that the horrendous crimes against humanity committed during the Holocaust are never forgotten, and that its relevance for each new generation is understood. We would like to acknowledge, thank, and share our gratitude for Mayor Byron Brown and County Executive Mark Polenkartz. They are outstanding upstanders in our community who have addressed anti-Semitism directly and are committed to protecting the freedoms of all Americans. Thank you to Mayor Brown and County Executive Polenkartz for issuing and signing a joint proclamation declaring April 4th through April 11th in Buffalo and Erie County as the Days of Remembrance of the Victims of the Nazi Holocaust in honoring those who courageously stood up to evil. Remembrance obligates us to focus not only on memorializing those who were murdered, but also on reflecting upon what could have been done to save them. As the 21st century unfolds, we must do what we can to prevent the Holocaust from becoming a distant memory. In the words of Elie Wiesel, because if we forget, we are guilty. We are accomplices. We are obligated to remember, painful as it is, that the hatred that bred the Holocaust still exists. We recognize that the Holocaust is not just a Jewish tragedy, it is fundamentally a human tragedy. It's terrifying that the kind of terror and inhumanity that was demonstrated with the Holocaust can too easily occur and has continued to occur. The fact that human beings have experienced genocide in Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda, Syria, Darfur, Burma, and now China informs us that our responsibility for one another is not being fully met. We have witnessed community members from all backgrounds coming together and saying never again. But we need to be vigilant. There are many local initiatives led by our mayor, county executive, and many other groups that are working to build bridges and strengthen our community. In order to turn never again into a reality, there must be continued efforts around the world to build a permanent anti-hate and anti-genocide constituency that will hold all governments accountable for acts of hatred and genocide. Yet, remembrance is the first step, and remembering comes with responsibility. Let us all commit to helping build a world in which the lessons of the Holocaust are taught and in which all human lives are valued. It is now my honor to introduce Rabbi Sarah Rich to give the invocation. Lador Vador, we pass our stories from one generation to another. This fluid motion of our past into our future is what keeps us always moving forward, informed by our past. The expression the door by door can also be translated in each and every generation. This means that the links of our chain are added one at a time. Our flow of history is not one long process, but rather relies on each generation sharing with the next. Each of us is responsible to hear and to tell. Sharing these stories, Lador Vador, is an act of love, an act of fear, and an act of hope. An act of love, because we know that the stories of the Holocaust can be very painful to share, but our survivors and their descendants share them so that we may learn. May we accept their stories with the love with which they are offered as a privilege entrusted to us. Sharing stories is an act of fear, of urgency. What will happen if I don't share? Will the horrors of the Holocaust be forgotten or God forbid repeated? May we receive these stories as a comfort against their fears. We must promise that we will not forget and that we will share these stories to the next generation with the same level of urgency. Last, sharing stories, the door of a door, 
is an act of hope, a belief, despite tremendous evidence to the contrary, that we as humans can do better. We owe it to our survivors to not become cynical when we hear their stories, but rather to share in their hope that our world can be a better place and we must work towards that vision each day. We pray to you, God, to hold in your loving arms our survivors and their descendants as they share their stories. And bless us that we may be worthy to listen and courageous enough to tell the door of a door in each and every generation. May this be God's will. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Rich, for your thoughtful and inspiring invocation. In keeping with this inspiring message, in a moment you will see a video that shows that even in the darkest of times, love and a connection with others is possible. The video is a story of the first meeting of Gerda and Kurt Klein in May of 1945. Gerda was 15 years old when her hometown in Poland was invaded in September of 1939 by Nazi Germany. In her memoir, All But My Life, she shares her experiences of losing family and friends, of life in concentration camps, of the death march she endured, and of her eventual liberation in 1945. Kurt, who was born in Germany in 1920, was sent by his parents to the United States in 1937 at 17 years of age. In 1942, he was drafted into the United States Army and served as an intelligence officer where he would eventually be part of the liberation in 1945. After World War II, Gerda and Kurt would build a life together, and for them, Buffalo would become the place where tragedy transcended into happiness. Following this moving video, you will then see a special video message from Gerda today at age 96 to her fellow Buffalonians. My very clear um, view of, of freedom and liberation came that morning when I stood in this doorway of that abandoned factory and I saw a car coming down the hill. And the reality of that came when I saw the white star on its hood and not the swastika. There were two men in that car one jumped out. I saw some skeletal figures uh, uh, trying to, to get some water from a hand pump, but over on the other side, uh, uh, leaning uh, next to the ent against the wall, next to the entrance of the building, I saw a girl standing, and, and I decided to go walk up to her. I remember that aura of, in of that awe, of, of, of that disbelief in daylight to really see someone who fought for our freedom, for my ideals. And uh, he looked like, like God to me. And I asked her in German and in English whether she spoke either language, and she answered me in, in German. And I, uh, I knew what I had to say. And I said to him, we are Jewish, you know, for a very long time. At least to me it seemed very long, but he didn't answer me. And then his own voice betrayed his emotion. He was wearing dark glasses, I couldn't see his eyes. He said, so am I. I asked uh, about her companions. He said, may I see the other ladies? A form of address we hadn't heard for six years. I told him, most of the girls were inside, they were too ill to walk. And he said to me, won't you come with me? I didn't know what he meant. So he, he held the door open for me and let me proceed him. And that was the moment of restoration of, of humanity, of humaneness, of dignity, of freedom. We went inside the factory. Uh, it was an indescribable scene. Uh, there were 
women scattered over the floor on scraps of straw, uh, some, some of them quite obviously with a mark of death on their faces. I took him to see my friends. The girl who was my guide uh, made sort of a sweeping gesture over this scene of devastation and said the following words. Noble be man, merciful and good. And I could hardly believe that she was able to summon a poem by the German poet Goethe, which was called, is called, The Divine uh, at such a moment. And there was nothing that she could have said that would have underscored the grim irony of the situation better than, than what she did. And his first young American of Liberation Day is now my husband. He opened not only the door for me, but the door to my life and my future. I am so delighted that I have the opportunity once more to say a few words to the city which is the most beautiful, most beloved, kindest and most wonderful city in the entire world, Buffalo, New York. Uh, and I have had the privilege, as you probably know, to speak all over the world and I've always said, whenever I was asked, what is it? Is it Paris? Is it London? Is it Jerusalem? And I said, no, there is no city in the world that I love more. It's Buffalo, New York. Uh, Buffalo is the city of my freedom, which my beloved husband brought me after we were married, and my children were born in Buffalo. And you can well imagine what it means to me now that my baby, who is now a grandfather, was asked to speak in Buffalo and uh, Yom HaShoah. He was born in Buffalo, of course. And uh, it means a great deal to me that he can speak to Buffalo and in Buffalo, where the, uh, the best years of my life were the years after the war, when I came to Buffalo as a young bride and all my children were born in Buffalo. And Buffalo, to me, is still, in my memory, my home, the true home that Buffalo was. It's always called, of course, it's the city of good neighbors, and it is much more than that. It's, it has always been a very special highlight and light in my life. So I'm sending with my son my greetings to by now probably the children and grandchildren of my friends when I first came to Buffalo in 1946 and I'm um, sending my best wishes and much love. Uh, and enjoy it, enjoy the snow, enjoy the bad weather. There is still, as far as I'm concerned, uh, very few places in the world that can compare with the goodness of Buffalo and my own memories there. Much love, shalom, shalom, all good wishes. You will now hear from our keynote speaker, Jim Klein. Jim is the son of Gerda and Kurt Klein. He was born and grew up in Buffalo, New York. Since 1979, he and his family have lived in Washington, D.C. Jim and his wife, Lynn, have been married for 40 years. They have two daughters, a son-in-law, and two grandchildren. In his professional life, Jim is president of the American Benefits Council, a trade association representing primarily Fortune 500 companies and organizations that sponsor or administer health and retirement benefits. Jim has also served as an officer on several nonprofit boards of directors, including Covenant House Washington, American Friends of the Anne Frank House, Americans for Generational Equity, and Washington Hebrew Congregation. We are fortunate and honored to hear from Jim today. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this very meaningful ceremony and for the very kind things that have been said about my parents. As you heard from the recording that my mom did, she greatly loves Buffalo, as do I. So I'd like to just use my few moments of remarks to comment on some of the fondest memories that I have about Buffalo that involve many of the other survivors of the Holocaust who were our family friends. Jean and Harry Blum, 
Lily and Julian Zilbiger, Helena and Eugene Bester, Ella and David Dotner, Trude and Moritz Friedler, Lily Kroinsky's family, Henry Ullman's family, Ruth and Eric Lansing, and so many others. And to talk about three things that I didn't fully appreciate as I was growing up, but certainly do appreciate better now that I'm a father and a grandfather. The first is that whether our parents who were survivors either kept their memories to themselves internally or shared them more openly, they each were displaying a fundamental parental instinct to protect their children. They were either protecting us against the horrors of their memories, or they were protecting us against their experiences being shrouded in mystery. But either way, what they did was a manifestation of their love for us. The second thing is I fully appreciate now, and better appreciate now, the courage and resiliency that they had to display, not just for what they endured during the Holocaust, but when they came to this country, not knowing the language, in all likelihood their education had been interrupted, had to learn a new skill, had little or no family support network, and yet they had to start a new life, start careers, raise a family. This is really remarkable when we think of the great start that we all have growing up. And then the third thing is to really understand what I think is their greatest accomplishment. It's not the businesses that they may have established or other things that people would commonly think of as a great lifetime achievement, but just the fact that they were able to emerge from the crucible the Holocaust and create a normal life. My life, my sister's lives, and those of, I think, the children of other survivors were very little different from those of the kids down the street. That is a great tribute to the strength and resilience of our parents. And I think maybe the best way that I thought to honor that is to try to display some of those same traits in my own life and to dedicate myself, as I think Holocaust Remembrance generally has done, to not only remembering the victims and the survivors, but to dedicate ourselves to fighting injustice around the world and in our own communities. Thank you so much for letting me be with you today. Thank you, Jim, for the beautiful keynote address. And thank you, Gerda, for everything you've done and continue to do to make sure the world never forgets your story and the horrors of the Holocaust, which is also the message we share now in the centerpiece of today's commemoration, the lighting of six memorial candles, six candles representing the six million Jewish lives lost during the Holocaust. Many of them don't have someone to light a candle or say Kaddish for them, so we are doing that to honor them. Our candles are lit by six local families. Some are joined by a loved one who survived the Holocaust. Others are remembering their loved one, a Holocaust survivor who passed in recent years. Each of their stories is unique and important. We are grateful to these families for sharing their stories with us and for honoring the legacies of their loved ones. My name is Cindy Ashton and um my father is Henry Bonick, and he is a Holocaust survivor. Fortune just happened to shine on him. He was one of the lucky ones. He always said how it could have been him as easily as the guy next to him because often the people who were killed were just random, just how the guards felt at the time. He was born in 1925 in Ludge, Poland, and he was uh, rounded up for the Ludge ghetto. They had no food. They were all forced to live in tiny little areas, and then um, they were shipped off to Auschwitz. 
My father was um, put in three different concentration camps, lived in there for three years, and then he, they put them on a death march to Eustadt, Germany. And then the torture of having to walk on the death marches in the freezing cold across the entire uh, length of Germany. And boarded a ship called the Cap Arcona, which was blown up. He doesn't swim. The, it's ice cold water sinking the 1st of May uh, in the North Sea. There's a rope that is on the end of the boat that he holds on to. The boat sinks, and it turns out the boat is six feet longer than the bay is deep. So the top six feet of the boat stands out of the water. The rest of the boat is on fire, and he gets. He survives just by doing that, and he is naked in the water. The boats come out to say, "Where are you? Uh, you know, we're here to say to take you back." And he said, "What concentration camp are we going to now?" And they said, "You're free." And my father cried every single time he told that story. And then he was brought back to shore, and the war that was there just three hours earlier is over. The war's over. And now he has a life to live. He makes his way all the way to stay in, back in Germany for a few years and then comes to America, meets his wife the first week he's in America, marries her, moves to Buffalo. He joins a family business with a, as a dry cleaner, runs the dry cleaning business for decades, ends up in a place in Florida in the winter like regular Americans have and raises a beautiful family that goes on to uh, <laughs> tell his story when he can't. We've been talking about his experiences for as long as I can remember. I don't remember a time when it, they like sat us down to tell us what happened. It just is something we grew up with. We went to Germany with my grandparents and we were able to retrace uh, my grandpa's steps with the whole family throughout the Holocaust. So that For was... the 60th anniversary of the death march. So the exact barn he was kept in, the posts along the road that were marked for his death march, we saw it all with our family. He saw it with his grandkids, all in one place, where, where the German governor came and uh, essentially he apologized for what they did to his family. I don't know uh, how you apologize for what you did, but it was a gesture that meant a lot to the family and he showed us that hate can't win. Love wins. In everything he's ever done, he's been a survivor, he's been successful, and he has a story to tell, and so I think he's raised our entire family on that mentality that anything we start, we want to finish, and we want to work hard because he was able to move to America and start the life for what we have now. His childhood was nothing like ours, but it was great. We've had him up until last year, all throughout our lives so far. Um, so he was able to see everything that we were able to accomplish and we were all very close to him and we we're just super grateful that he was there to teach us about how lucky we were. He was very proud of his family. Sag nit, kein Mal as du gehst dem letzten Weg, wenn ihm den Bleien er verstelle bleibt heg. Wir kommen wird nach unser Reus gebänkte Schau, s wird ab heut und unser Trat mir seinen da. Wir kommen wird nach unser Reus gebänkte Schau. Sveta poikt on unser trot mir seinen da, al nato mari ne dar chea achrona, et ore yomi stirush me hanana. Ze yom nich si fu od ya el viav yavo, umit sa deinu od yor imma nach nu po, von green in palmen blen vis weisen len von schnei, mir kummin on mit mit unser Pein, mit unser Wei, und wo gefallen sie das Spritz von unser Blut, sprotzen Wetter auf unser Gwura, unser 
Mahmud. Never say the final journey is at hand. Never say we will not meet the promised land. The long for hour shall come, oh never fear. Let's beat our drums to tell the world that we are here. Zognit ke molas du geistem lesten weg. Ben ihm len blayen erstellen, bläuet heg. Welkommen wird nach unser euch gebänkte Pickt on unser Trot mir seinen da. Welkommen wird nach unser Reis gebänkte Schab. Zweta peugt on unser Trot mir seinen da. My name is Sandy Eisen and uh, I am a second generation Holocaust survivor. Uh, my parents were both in the Holocaust. Uh, my father's name was William Eisen, and he was born in Miechow, Poland in 1920. There were four boys and one girl in the family. In 1940, the Jews of Miechow uh, were placed in a ghetto uh, very crowded and, and uh, with little food. And uh, my father uh, was able to sneak out at night and get food and other things for the residents of the ghetto. In 1942, uh, they liquidated the ghetto and put everybody on, on trains uh, in boxcars. Uh, my father never saw the rest of his family after that. All in all, he uh, traveled to four different labor camps and Buchenwald was his last camp. And he um, was put on in a death march they started with 900 prisoners, and after five days, only uh, 180 survived. He was ultimately freed by the Russians, um, and he went to Landsberg, Germany, which was a DP camp. There he met my mother, and uh, a year later, they got married, and a year later, I was born. I was 10 months old when we came to Buffalo. I spoke Yiddish only for five years, and then I attended Buffalo Public Schools. I am a dentist, and I have a lovely family. My father was very successful in men's clothing until he retired. And uh, my father was one of the founders of the Holocaust Resource Center in Buffalo. This is my father's book. It's called Two Pounds of Sugar. And the title comes from uh, what was reward was given to a local farmer for turning my grandmother into the Nazis. May God grant wisdom and strength to our country's leaders and to the people of our great country to fight evil wherever it may exist. Then suffering of humanity shall be ceased forever. And I, 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 I feel that that's a beautiful quote at the end of this book. My name is Shane Grant. Um, my grandmother, Sarah Eisen, was born in 1923 in Poland. Um, she was in four concentration camps. I'm going to tell you about what happened to her when she was in Auschwitz. She was selected um, by Dr. Mengele to be in the line to go to the gas chambers. And she realized this. 
so she bolted and um, a guard hit her um, very hard on the spine but she got up and ran and dove into the line with the healthy women. Another story about my grandmother is when she was in Auschwitz, a female SS guard uh, told her that she looked too Aryan for a Jewish woman. Shortly thereafter, that guard um, threw acid on her head and burned her hair off. The grandma I knew um, wore a wig. She's one of my greatest role models in my life, and I think about her all the time. And I think that um, when life gets hard and is unfair, if she could do what she did and still see the beauty in life, then I can too. My name is Carol Froelich, and both my parents, um, Edith Stern Froelich and Walter Froelich, were both uh, Holocaust survivors. My mother was born March 13, 1923, in Rittelheim, a, a suburb of Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, while in high school, it became clear she would need to immigrate. In February 1939, my mother received permission to go to Sweden with the kinder, kinder transport at, at uh, 16 years old. She spent a year and a half in Falun, Sweden, cooking for 60 to 80 children, and then left for the United States with two Swedish children. She went three quarters around the world. 45 days uh, to Buffalo, to New York, where her parents and grandmother uh, came in 1940. My father, Walter Froelich, was born October 19, uh, 1916, in Eisenberg in the Fouts. 
the youngest of three with two older sisters. In 1936, my father's uh, parents uh, felt that he should leave and he was sponsored by a distant relative in Chicago and came to the United States. In 1939, he finished basic training for the U.S. Army and in 1940 uh, was in the Army um, Corps of Engineers. Um, during World War II, he was in Germany and in France. Uh, his parents, when he was on furlough, he would look for them and later, later found out uh, that they were killed in Auschwitz um, in December 1942. A distant relative of my father and an aunt of my mother um, asked my father to write to my mother, and they corresponded for three years um, while my dad, you know, was in the army. They were married um, June 9th, 1946, and they have. Um, they had three children, myself, uh, my brother, my older brother, William Froelich, and um, my younger brother, John Froelich. Because of both, both my parents' uh, educational pursuits had to be uh, derailed because of having to leave Germany. And the message basically was for us to be able to stand on our own feet and to be able to um, receive the education that we needed in order to pursue what we wanted to be. And I guess uh, uh, appreciation, appreciation for others and um, thankfulness for the life uh, that they were, you know, that they gave us as well as thankfulness to the people who helped us achieve and become who we are, you know, who we are today. When I was little, I was embarrassed to go to Hebrew school when everyone else went to church. And my dad just always said, remember who you are, like be proud of who you are and what our family has done. And I think from there, it just inspired me to want to go to Israel and go on birthright and kind of see this other land um, where it was kind of like a shelter for our people to take refuge in. And that has just made, ever since going to that trip, made me want to support Jewish causes. I just also wanted to add with what we saw this past summer with Black Lives Matter and what we're seeing now with hate towards Asians. I feel like we just feel this, the same pain that those communities are going through and want to do all we can, I feel like, to support anyone else who's going through a rough time. And once they came here, they both like dedicated their lives to public service. She was always dedicated to her community and her neighborhood um, throughout her entire life. Um, and even Opa coming to America, immediately joining the U.S. Army, like a foreign country. Uh, to fight for a cause against this homeland. I think that's so powerful. It certainly inspired me to pursue a, a career in law enforcement, which I started um, while I was still in college. There will come a time very shortly from now where there won't be any Holocaust survivors left, and it rests solely on generations to come to pass along those memories, not let that fade and, and keep the history alive. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. My name is Max Sloan, and uh, these are my parents. My father, Sal Sloan, Shaul Bear Shlomovitz, and my mother, Gertrude Sloan, Gisela Solomon, and they are Holocaust survivors. My father was born 
in a small uh, shuttle in Romania in 1914. And uh, this picture is uh, his family that were killed in Auschwitz the first day that they arrived. This is his wife, his little daughter, Yenta, and his son, Shlomo. My grandfather always said they arrived at Auschwitz and his children were literally ripped from his arms, ripped from his arms, his little baby. My father escaped death on the first day he arrived there because they asked people if they had a trade. And he said he had a trade, he had no trade. He was sent from one camp to another and it was 1945 when uh, he was liberated. This is a picture of my mother's family, her grandmother, her mother, aunts, uncles, cousins, they were all taken away to Auschwitz and destroyed. She was not able to talk about this because uh, was so emotionally upset over the whole thing. Uh, she cannot, it's very difficult for her to deal with it. We get spotty stories here and there. She'll talk about things here and there, but not, not very much. She was very young when she was taken away. And uh, she recounts when, uh, when they went to Auschwitz, how they took her mother and her grandmother. And she was a slave labor and she survived, although she, it, she was very sick for most of the time. My grandparents were both from Romania and after the war they went back to Romania, to Cluj, to see if anybody had survived from their families. And that's when they ran into each other and one thought that they knew them but they, they didn't, they didn't have the name right, but they talked and that's when they, um, they got together then. Both my sister and I were born in DP camps. We came to the United States in 1949. An uncle of ours uh, sponsored us and that's, that's it. We were here in Buffalo and my father uh, several years later opened a, uh, opened a store. And then he opened another store and uh, and he always told his story to everyone that would listen. My father passed away in 2005, 16 years ago, at 93. He always says, I'm 93, I'm alive, and Hitler's dead. And he, he always had a smile. He always had a good word to say. And he, uh, he was a very special person. My mother was a hard worker, my father's companion. She's 96 now, and she's, and she's in good health, and she still takes care of animals and birds and uh, has so much wisdom. She always talks about how happy she is to be in America and how lucky everyone has it, and just to not take anything for granted and to live life to the fullest. She wants the kids to take dance lessons and music lessons because she couldn't do any of that. There was a lot of discrimination. You have to remember that you have these freedoms, that you have, that you have peace, that you can pray the way you want, that you, uh, that you have food on the table, that you uh, shouldn't take these things for granted, that these are blessings. Kaddish for those who have perished in the Shoah. They have left their lives to us. Let a million prayers rise wherever Jews worship. Let a million candles glow against the darkness of these unfinished lives. Yit Gadal v'yit Kadash Shimei Rabbah. V'yalma divra chirutei v'yamlich machutei.
v'chayechon uv'yomechon uv'chayei d'chol b'et Yisrael v'agala uv'izman kariv v'imru amen. Yehe shmei rabba mevarach le'olam olamei amaya. Yit barach v'yishtabach v'yit pa'ar v'yit roman v'yit nasei v'yit adar v'yit ala v'yit alal shmei d'kudsha b'richu. Le'ela min kol birchata v'shirata Chushpachata v'nechamata, da'amiram b'alma v'imru, amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shmaya, v'chayim aleinu v'al kol Yisrael, v'imru, amen. Ose shalom b'imramav, hu ya'ase shalom, aleinu v'al kol Yisrael, v'imru, amen. I tell you as a child, I really didn't comprehend everything what was going on. I know the food was shortage and sometimes you went hungry and if you found a piece of sugar cube in your pocket, that was a wonderful thing to have. My name is Eva Wallenfels Bloom. I am a Holocaust survivor. I was born in Hungary, 1937, March 9th. German soldiers, they raided the house. The Jews, we have to go out to the veranda and then my mother suggested to my brother to take to go upstairs and hide until somebody take us. My mother, she was taken away in Auschwitz. And my father already was in a forced labor camp. My brother and I went to a protected house where only Jews lived. My father came back to visit on his furlough and the housemaster told him, your wife and the two kids were taken away. And my father decided there is no reason for him to live anymore. So he cozied up with the brother who had the typhus and he died there. After the war, my mom came back from Auschwitz, but unfortunately, shortly after that, she passed away because she collected sepsis. I lived in Hungary, went to high school, agricultural, and after that, I went to Germany, and then I went to, applied to go to the US because my brother was here. Uh, it definitely wasn't a secret in our house. Uh, they were pretty, my, our, my parents and uh, my grandmother were pretty open about it. Um, I knew how uh, she and my uh, grandfather, who was also a Holocaust survivor, uh, met here in the U.S. and uh, had a family and uh, kind of lived the American dream. I think it definitely has impacted me. I think um, probably my uh, love for Israel and uh, belief in its existence is probably forged by that. Knowing my grandparents' uh, history of being Holocaust survivors, um, I think definitely makes me more grateful for the situation I was kind of, or the life I was kind of born into, uh, having uh, freedoms of religion and uh, really being able to uh, really stand up for anything you believe in and not getting um, uh, punished for it. And I think it makes me realize uh, really how hard uh, people can like work and uh, if you're determined enough to do anything, 
uh, fight for it and uh, you can survive. It's important to know that I don't think it's just a, a Jewish issue. Obviously anti-Semitism is, but that hatred has no uh, bounds. The reason that we do that is to hopefully shed light on what's going on in today's world. I think it should be learned in school so like people knows what happened so it cannot happen again. When you see and hear survivors speak their story and the impact that it has on especially when it's you know for students and younger children that's uh, that is the hope. Never give up and try to do what you believe in. They are smart and they are doing the right thing. Both my grandsons. Forget your son. <laughs> that goes without saying, Jeff. They are They're taking good. after you. A poem I wrote, the very thing that makes us fly. There's so much sadness, oceans of it, whole planets. If we are not watchful, it can seep into our every moment and round them like a tear. If you haven't already, watch for it. On the faces of those you love, even the happiest among us. Listen to it in song and story, in the very air we breathe. You ask for me to cry with you and not stand up and walk away. So much of it seeps into me, like oceans, planets, like your soul itself, hoping that deep black hole that you say sits in your dreams will lift off of your heart, flying like a shadow, and disappear into the darkness of the room in which we sit. Sadness is just like that. Feel it even in this poem, the very thing that makes us fly. I'm Nick Leibovic. Uh, I was born in a small town in Lithuania, a shtetl in Yiddish. Uh, my mother tongue is Yiddish. And when uh, I was ready for school, my father took me and my two sisters to a German speaking part of Lithuania. Uh, where we went to a German school because that was the best in the area. I almost finished school, but then I was kicked out because I was a Jew. My father decided to take me to England. And the idea was that I would finish my education there. And then uh, the plan was that the rest of the family would follow when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, I did not have any more communication with my parents or my family. They fled and went on to Samarkand eventually, where they spent the war. My father died there. My parents, my mother and two sisters came back to Lithuania. And I uh, learned what a horrible, uh, affair and adventure it was for them to go from Lithuania to Samarkand. As for myself, I met uh, my love of my life, Mary Murray. She had come from Berlin on a kinder transport. We married. We had three sons. One of them Fortunately, is not with us anymore. And unfortunately, my wife isn't with me anymore. Well, we were in England and we were perfectly happy. But then uh, after Sputnik, uh, Americans came over to the United Kingdom and recruited everybody they could find. 
And so I came to America with my family. Uh, at first at Westinghouse in Pittsburgh, where I did some research. And then in Buffalo, where uh, I joined the university. I know the story well about my maternal grandparents' lives in Germany. Uh, and then they went to Holland uh, on their way to the U.S., but never made it and instead ended up remaining in hiding in Holland throughout the duration of the war. It's an incredible act of heroism and generosity uh, from the family that hid my grandparents. I think one of the most important things that he uh, passed on to me was um, family, certainly. Um, but also approaching uh, life with um, with uh, 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 with education and with logic. He just encourages me and my brothers and everyone he's around to always um, be curious and to spend as much uh, time of our life doing things that we really love to do and stop and smell the roses as he often reminds my dad to do. Uh, when I'd learned about the Holocaust growing up, it all seemed a bit abstract and surprising that such a terrible thing could happen, that evil could come so close to winning. Even today, we have one to three million Uyghurs who are being kept in concentration camps in China. This sort of thing could happen anywhere, and it is happening. And hearing stories of my grandfather and my grandmother it helps me remember that. You, you, one has to open one's eyes and see. It has to do with a cultural acceptance of something that's completely wrong. And on the one hand, or recognizing it and, and overcoming it. It, it, there's no such thing as never again. It's a constant ever present danger and tendency. Looking back, if I can really try to think about what's something really special or specific that my grandpa has taught me. And I think it would probably be to go through the world with open eyes and no judgment. Sometimes I feel really honored that I even know him as a person. And then I think back and I'm like, but wait, he's my grandpa. He's my grandpa. How incredible is that? And how lucky am I? Because he's all mine. Like he's my grandpa. <laughs> Something that's super special to me about him is we're both born on the same day. He's really nice. And I'm just grateful to have a grandpa like him. Of on all the holidays or the Jewish holidays, he calls and says, happy whatever holiday it is <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And he takes it seriously, probably the more of any of buddy. <laughs> um, I think one thing also that I'm really, really just so honored to be his granddaughter for is, is the legacy that he has created in his children and his grandchildren and his great grandchildren. And the lesson to me very largely is to make sure that people remember it, but also to remember that there was no Israel when all this happened. If Israel had been in existence, the lives of six million people could have been saved. As it was, no country was ready to admit the Jews.
We worry sometimes that the lessons of the Holocaust will be lost to future generations. I worry about that sometimes as well. But I felt a little better after I asked my daughter about what she knows about the Holocaust. The Holocaust was one of the most uh, harmful acts of genocide in history, one of the most darkest periods in human history, in fact. My great-grandfather was a survivor of the Holocaust. He lost most of his family in the Russian labor camps, and he and his brother immigrated to Canada after the war was over. Many, sur many survivors' stories have, have been recounted again and again. Survivors have been labeled as heroes, and every single uh, person who died in the Holocaust must be remembered. The Holocaust should not be forgotten. We are all witnesses. Every generation that lives today and every generation that will follow. May the lessons of the Holocaust, may the memories of the survivors and of the victims always stay with us, Lador Vador, from generation to generation. Amen.